ocazia să întrebați dacă aveți niște proiecte sau niște lucruri care sunt uh, într-un fel sau altul legate de tehnologie de internet de mine de viață. Discutați cu So how I briefly Yeah, the, I understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Long relation with uh, the department. Romania with the department mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yes, so of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so welcome being... everybody. Uh, yeah, this is a special uh, occasion for me because uh, at this uh, department, in this very place, I uh, started uh, teaching new media. So um, um, I. I was in my early 30s and um, I was uh, an editor of the media art magazine called Mediamatic uh, in the uh, early 90s and um, I can't remember if I came here first time in March 90, I don't think so, that was my first visit, but in the second visit in uh, 91 I definitely uh, showed up uh, here and, uh, and then in uh, 91, 92 and 93 I, um, uh, I was um, often here and um, um, in 93 I also spent s some longer periods of time uh, here in, um, in Bucharest uh, to prepare for the Ex Oriente Lux um, uh, exhibition. Um, so the looks was the first mm. video exhibition in, in Romania. In Romania, yeah. Ah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so it, uh, um, so the, when I think of teaching, I, I often think of uh, this place, and I, I have been coming back uh, since then a little bit uh, irregular, so I, I tried to find the pattern in uh, <laughs> when I show up here, but I couldn't figure it out. So, uh, so that is a little bit uh, uh, unclear, I have to say, and I, I apologize uh, for that. Um, um, so uh, I want to come back more often, but uh, yeah, I don't know exactly. Um, I, I hope to be back soon. Uh, to uh, give um, a um, today masterclass because uh, what you will see here in this morning is a very condensed, uh, let's say, version of uh, what, uh, what I uh, usually do when I come to an art school and teach. So I, yeah, I need to work with a, a class for two days to, to go through all the topics. Uh, I will rush through that um, uh, this morning. And, um, and then uh, uh, after that, uh, I will uh, present my, my new work uh, here. Um, I finished it um, in November or December, and um, it comes out in this uh, spring. Uh, it's from a book called Sad by Design, and it deals with uh, melancholia in uh, the age of the smartphone. Um, and uh, so I'm going to um, give you this uh, lecture, uh, which is new, a new lecture. Um, uh, so I'm excited uh, about that. Uh, yeah, so, um, so it has two parts. Uh, now I wonder, um, can you give me some water? Because maybe I need I need it. Uh, um, is is there some? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, there is water. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Huh? Oh. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. Uh, yeah, maybe we have to switch off this and then we go to the presentation. Okay. All right. Mm, right, there we are. 
Okay, so this is part one uh, in which I'm, I'm, I'm explaining a little bit about um, uh, my work and uh, the approach of the center and so on and so on. Uh, Joseph already said um, in the 90s I was uh, very much uh, active in Eastern Europe and um, uh, also based in Berlin and um, many other places, Budapest. Um, and then I moved to Australia, I did my uh, PhD there and, um, and then I came back with, uh, with my uh, family. Uh, can you leave the door open maybe? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I came back and um, uh, I started um, this, uh, this center. So since uh, 2004, uh, I have this unique uh, small uh, place. It's called the Institute of Network Cultures. Uh, it's in, inside, a, let's say, a design school, uh, a polytech. It's not a university. Uh, so um, it's like you know, professional education, applied science. I don't know if that means anything here, but yeah. Anyway, it's not a university. It's not that kind of um, uh, teaching. Uh, and um, it's a small research unit. Uh, we are with uh, three or four people, and um, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, guests and uh, interns and people that, uh, that come and uh, work with us on uh, on a variety of, uh, of projects. So it, the center has been running now for 15 years, which, uh, you know, as you can imagine, uh, in, uh, in the internet uh, years uh, is a really long time, right? Um, I first, for the first time, encountered uh, internet uh, 30 years ago. So it's kind of, I have also another period before, before this. But, uh, this, you know, to, to run a, a small center like this for such a long time uh, is, uh, is quite a, is an achievement, uh, especially in the Netherlands, which is uh, completely dominated by budget cuts, neoliberal policy, creative industries, uh, and so on and so on. Like, a really quite, maybe you are familiar with that, a kind of brutal, uh, brutal policy. Huh? It's not like the Netherlands in the 90s. Uh, that is a long time ago, right? Um, so um, it was only in uh, 2011, the last time I was here, by the way, eight years ago, uh, that the, the, the budget for the culture uh, was cut in half. So 50% uh, of the money uh, was gone in one go, right? So many theaters were closed. Uh, many of the uh, new media uh, institutes and uh, initiatives that we founded uh, were gone uh, almost overnight, right? And so, um, yeah, the, the, the field has, has gone through uh, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of changes, by and large, uh, by either uh, focusing on different things or by be, you know, uh, taking on um, short-term commercial research and so on and so on, right? So, um, uh, so that is, uh, uh, yeah, that has also dominated, um, I, I have to say, the last years of, uh, of my um, uh, involvement in this. Uh, I have not really been able uh, anymore to find money for the projects uh, in the way that uh, I used to. Uh, let's say, uh, even when I started uh, 15 or 10 years ago, um, maybe the darkest uh, of hours was uh, in uh, 2017, when uh, we didn't have any money uh, to spend on any projects. So funny enough, there were some salaries uh, continued, so we, we could do work, but yeah, we couldn't uh, find uh, the money. Maybe also because I'm not very good at, uh, you know, writing uh, brilliant uh, EU funding applications and uh, becoming part of very fancy consortia and so on and so on, right? That this is not uh, my background. Mm? Uh, so, yeah, so there, there, uh, and of course, 
also in this time, in this uh, kind of time of, of austerity and budget cuts and, and neoliberal policies, we cannot expect, we cannot simply, um, uh, you know, uh, presume that, uh, let's say, the critique of new media is something that is appreciated and, we, uh, and that you will be rewarded for, for your critique. <laughs> now, you, 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 in, in general, you are not rewarded for criticism, right? I mean, that's not what you can expect, right? I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So, but sometimes you, you find some uh, allies or you find some possibilities. Um, but in this period, uh, recent period, uh, it, is, uh, it is quite difficult. Okay. So, uh, this is our website. And uh, the, the website is called net, uh, networkcultures.org. And um, uh, there you can find the projects, the publications. Uh, the newsletter, uh, so uh, because we, uh, I left Facebook in 2010 and then uh, f a few years later my center uh, decided to leave as well. Uh, so um, so we, uh, yeah, we don't use uh, uh, Facebook uh, anymore. And um, so, um, uh, so, but what we do is we use a monthly, uh, monthly newsletter. So if you want to find out what we are doing, uh, the best way uh, is, uh, is, and then you get uh, an email once a month. Uh, Can you detail a bit uh, why did you left uh, Facebook? Because, yeah, here in the United States, uh, oh, okay. uh, you are under the spell of Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> you are mesmerized still, even, even 10 years later, 15 years later. Okay, no, no, yeah, I, I will uh, talk about that, but uh, yeah, because this is not the two day masterclass, I, I cannot possibly go into uh, all the, because we are doing a lot of work. Uh, in fact, my main activity is working on social media alternatives, right? And social media critique and social media alternatives. So uh, this is a very, um, uh, very important uh, part of our, our work. Um, um, also, uh, there it says uh, matchmaking, art criticism, uh, Kunstkritik uh, in Dutch. Uh, that is a new, uh, a new field for us a new network that uh, we started maybe uh, a year or two years ago. We've been working on uh, the future of art criticism. Art criticism for us is very, very important. The future of criticism in all the disciplines is very, very, uh, uh, you know, our, our main concern. Uh, because when the criticism goes, you know that the discipline itself, uh, you know, is next. Uh, if there is no thinking uh, anymore, uh, then uh, you know it will stop uh, very soon after, right? So uh, uh, this this uh, this is now a European network, and if you are interested in it, you can become uh, you know member and and become active uh, in it. If you um, and it's especially looking at uh, uh, you know what is the what are the new delivery forms for art criticism? If it's not anymore the, the the classical paper magazine or something like that, and how do young uh, generations think uh, you know about how we can develop a, a, a lively form of dialogue uh, about critique uh, uh, using the tools of today? Okay. So, uh, and, and this has been, uh, yeah, this is a small program, but uh, for us, it, it, it's really a one that is, uh, that is, uh, that is growing. Um, it was uh, started, by the way, uh, by our uh, fellow friends from, uh, from Fra Flanders, because uh, in Belgium, uh, they are uh, much, much more focused. They have, by the way, more money. Uh, because they have not gone through this ridiculous budget cuts. And so they are much more focused on the question of how to organize uh, new forms of uh, art criticism. And by the way, art criticism for us is quite broad, right? It includes the visual arts, but uh, in the same way, we know that the literature criticism is under threat as well. We, uh, in Amsterdam or in, uh, in the Netherlands, of course, what is very important uh, is the architecture uh, criticism, right? Because architecture, okay. 
uh, yeah, it's an important uh, you know activity where I come from, and the same is of course the case with uh, design and design criticism. What uh, almost nobody knows what design criticism is, but uh, okay, uh, this is uh, this is necessary to uh, to think about. Okay. Um, this is uh, our most, uh, the oldest and most active network, and it's called Video Vortex. And uh, every year, about every year, we meet uh, somewhere. And it was started in 2006 when uh, when YouTube uh, was uh, really um, um, happening. So. Um, uh, we were a few years into the center, and we, I come, I, as I said, you know, I have a background in uh, video art. So uh, the, the making of YouTube uh, was, was uh, long, uh, you know, anticipated, and YouTube had, uh, of course, a lot of uh, predecessors, right? Because people have been experimenting with video online for a long time, for at least uh, at, at least a decade before. Uh, YouTube showed up, right? And so, uh, but of course, the, the, it was an important moment because uh, uh, then uh, suddenly through the World Wide Web, people could uh, directly access uh, online video. <clears throat> so this is a lively community, uh, by and large, almost uh, independent. Uh, it consists of about 500 uh, artists, uh, programmers, <coughs> curators, researchers, and so on, worldwide, that are working on, on, on what is still a very, very niche topic. Uh, so we are faced with this incredible um, paradox uh, that uh, everybody is using online video. Uh, and with, with that, uh, I don't uh, only mean YouTube, but think of uh, you know, Facebook Live or uh, the use of uh, f video on Facebook. Uh, of course, video uh, on Snapchat and so on and so on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Instagram also, also has um, that uh, capacity. Uh, so you know uh, all too well that uh, uh, online video is now almost uh, omnipresent, right? It doesn't really matter on which platform you are. Um, <coughs> and it is certainly not uh, limited anymore to YouTube. Uh, but uh, the, the, the study of it uh, is uh, still very uh, primitive, right? The study of YouTube, if at all, is dominated by people with a background from, from uh, film and from television. Uh, but these are, of course, not the, uh, the appropriate backgrounds to, to study uh, such a network uh, phenomena, right? Um, on online video is not an extension, as we know, of cinema with other means, or you know, it's not an extension of television, right? It has its own dynamics, its own aesthetics. So, what what is this? What are the aesthetics of online video? That is the simple question, and the Video uh, Vortex um, uh, Network has been busy uh, with th that question now for uh, let's say 12. Uh, 12 or 13 years, we, we uh, do a lot of um, uh, public publications, as I said, um, uh, small, um, well, also workshops. And the next uh, video vortex is in Malta uh, in uh, late September. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, and the last one, as you can see here, uh, was in, uh, in the south of India, uh, in, uh, in Kerala. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 as part of the Kochi uh, Biennial, I don't know if you, if you are uh, working in India or if you have been there or know about it, but anyway, the uh, Kochi Biennial is, a, is a, one of the main <coughs> uh, contemporary art uh, biennials. Okay, another example, uh, that's uh, Society of the Query. Uh, this is a, uh, also still, uh, this is a small network, it's kind of still, al still alive, uh, but it's, about, it's quite an obscure topic, again, uh, because uh, it's about search and search engines. As you, as you might know, nobody is using search engines, huh? <laughs> so yeah, it, it's very, very strange, but uh, <laughs> yeah. 
almost nobody in the world is, is studying search engines. I, I can tell you, it's, it's too weird to be true, huh? but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so at least uh, three or four billion people around the world are using search engines and there's not a single place uh, that uh, you know, studies it. Um, hmm? Uh, and yeah, so this is kind of the the, the reality of uh, of uh, of, the, of the internet uh, uh, culture uh, as we uh, experience it. Right? There's an, an enormous um, overproduction of practice uh, and, uh, and very very little uh, reflection. Right? Because we are in a way uh, still busy. Uh, with catching up, like, oh, what's the latest, is there something else, and so on, so on, right? Uh, so uh, this is kind of still our, our, our mode. Uh, we are preparing uh, the third big event, uh, an international conference on uh, search. Uh, as you know, maybe or not, um, the second largest search engine is YouTube, right? So after we have YouTube, uh, of course, uh, we have um, <clears throat> uh, other search engines as well, like Baidu, uh, if you speak uh, you know, Chinese, uh, uh, you, you would know that uh, <coughs> Baidu is very uh, important, uh, Namdex uh, is too, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, search, search is a very um, important, but subliminal activity, right? We do not even notice anymore that we are searching. And the, the fact that it has become subliminal uh, is, uh, is in a way already part of the problem, right? We search, but uh, we, we find something, but before we know we have moved on, right? And so the, the, the shrinking of time of, the, of, the, of search, huh? Uh, is eliminating uh, the the topic itself. Uh, so this is this is a this is a real problem uh, when you deal uh, with this. Uh, so if you would study search, the, one of the first things let's say you would do is you would stretch the time hmm? in order to understand uh, you know what what is going on. Uh, something is something similar is happening uh, with uh, Wikipedia. Um, I don't know. Uh, has anyone used Wikipedia uh, lately? Uh, I suppose everybody has. But the problem is you haven't even noticed anymore, right? A lot of it uh, is uh, kind of cramped in the corner somewhere. You see the information popping up. Uh, you uh, spend some microseconds uh, on uh, what uh, what it says. Eh? and then uh, you, mo you move on, right? And if you're really researching a topic, very, very likely um, uh, in the first, second or third click, you will go to the Wikipedia site. Uh, I've been teaching Wikipedia uh, from the very, very beginning. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, unsexy and unpopular topic uh, these days. Hmm? Uh, yeah, uh, it is uh, it, uh, also in terms of research. There's almost almost no one in the world uh, is uh, is uh, studying it, right? Uh, it is um, the largest non-profit website in the top hundred of most used websites, right? So it still remains that uh, kind of position. Uh, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot of uh, problems happening uh, with Wikipedia. Um, and um, yeah, so, uh, so what to do, uh, what to do uh, with this? We are using it, we are using its information, uh, but uh, very few people uh, uh, continue to contribute uh, to it. And uh, yeah, officially uh, it's not allowed yet to speak about uh, a crisis, let's say an existential crisis, but I wouldn't be surprised that uh, very soon, um, you know, we'll, we'll get there. And it is in fact uh, Google that uh, kind of maintains, uh, you know, through its uh, funding of Wikipedia, uh, that Google
kind of pays for uh, the maintenance of, uh, of uh, the uh, Wikimedia infrastructure uh, that exists also in a country like Romania with national chapters and so on and so on, right? Uh, you probably know uh, this, the, the situation. Uh, this program uh, we developed with uh, our partners in India, in Bangalore. Um, uh, it ran for maybe three or four years, but this one definitely stopped. Uh, that's not the case, as I already said, uh, with Unlike Us. Unlike Us is still existing, a little bit small, but uh, uh, still this is the, the network that, uh, that is focusing on uh, the social media alternatives. Okay, so it's easy to complain about Facebook and uh, surveillance and so on and so on, right? Um, uh, and this was already the case uh, in um, 2011 when we started this, seven years ago, eight years ago. And yeah, the, the problem is of course that things have not really moved very quickly. Uh, this is a, this is a, 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 a really strange example of a, of a very dynamic internet that is, co uh, that is creating its own new form of stagnation in the form of monopolies, in the form of uh, you know, uh, making people depending, uh, not being able to switch, right? Uh, even five or ten years ago, I would have thought uh, that people would uh, very quickly uh, move on in the same way as uh, you know we used to switch from GeoCities uh, to Friendster uh, to uh, MySpace and so on and so on. Right? Maybe you remember. Um, yeah, uh, people were flexible uh, and they had this kind of uh, crowd behavior. Like, okay, the crowd is moving to another platform. Okay, there we go. Huh? But. Uh, Five or ten years ago, we all got stuck. Yeah? Uh, we got stuck on uh, on the same on the same platform, and um, yeah, uh, this is a, a, this is a called ca platform capitalism, uh, and this is what uh, what hap what happens uh, when uh, when we are locked in uh, into uh, a system. <clears throat> uh, okay, so. Um, so, but okay, there are still uh, very few people who work on it, and maybe you are using some of the uh, alternatives that have uh, come up. Uh, maybe you are using DuckDuckGo, the alternative search engine. Maybe you are using Signal or Telegram or um, uh, some of the other uh, messaging um, um, uh, softwares and apps uh, that are available. <coughs> who knows? Uh, but they're not very widespread, and uh, it's really difficult to, uh, to crack the monopoly, uh, up to the point that now uh, people expect that uh, for the American presidential elections of 2020, the breaking up uh, through antitrust law uh, of the big five uh, giant, tech giants is going to be the number one uh, uh, topic uh, of, of the upcoming election. So that is going to be uh, very, very interesting uh, to, to witness. The question is, you know, what, what, what do we do? Uh, do we have alternatives? We, meaning, you know, us Europeans, are we just sitting there in the chair and, and watching? Um, uh, you, you know, using our Chinese hardware and uh, uh, installing the American apps, is that really the European destiny? Uh, or, or, I mean, uh, w where, uh, where are we uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this unfolding uh, drama, if you like? Uh, and so this is a real uh, question. It's a question, of course, we can ask ourselves. We can also project it onto Brussels and say, well, Brussels is to blame, uh, you know, where are you? Um, yeah. But uh, we know that also in the next, uh, let's say, year, two years or more, uh, this issue uh, is going to be, become only bigger and bigger and bigger. Hmm? The more uh, there is at stake, and we know there is a lot at stake, 
uh, after Trump and Brexit and uh, alt-right and uh, uh, all, the, all the topics we know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into them here, but uh, yeah, we know that there's a lot at, at stake with fake news and so on and so on. The political class itself uh, you know, has, been, uh, has been hit directly uh, by, by this. Uh, will the uh, answer of Europe only be regulation or do we have something else? Uh, you know, do we also have a, another kind of collective imagination? Uh, how would we define uh, the social in social media? What is social for us? Hmm? Uh, and um, uh, how would we like to uh, design these, uh, these network architectures? This is really uh, what, uh, what, is at, uh, what, uh, what is at stake. <clears throat> another uh, kind of complicating layer there that we have, uh, we ran into in, uh, in June 2013, maybe you remember, uh, with uh, the uh, revelations of Edward Snowden. Um, and um, uh, then uh, a whole uh, new layer uh, was discovered, what uh, Shuzhana Zuboff now uh, has coined uh, surveillance capitalism, right? Maybe you've heard about this big, thick new book that this um, former Harvard professor has uh, written. Uh, it came out uh, maybe two, two months ago. Uh, and in, in this book uh, deals with the kind of the systematic uh, architecture of what she calls surveillance capitalism, right? And Edward Snowden is, of course, one of the people who has uh, given us very detailed uh, evidence uh, for it. Um, one of the complicating factors there is um, how do we respond to it, right? How do we respond to knowing that uh, everything we do, even our most intimate things uh, between friends and lovers uh, is stored and uh, uh, can, be, uh, can be used against us? Uh, so what is this? Um, are we going to uh, go for um, a, um, yeah, a, a radical democratization, or do we have to uh, you know, protect each and every citizen? Uh, what is the future of, uh, of the open web uh, in a time of, uh, of crypto paranoia, right? And so this is a real uh, issue. What does it mean uh, to, ha to be able to uh, uh, communi communicate in a safe way? Uh, way. This is an issue uh, of what we call uh, crypto design, because crypto is, is not just uh, you know, uh, a complicated algorithm. Um, it's uh, also very, very much uh, a question of how ordinary users are being able to, um, yeah, to use it, right? And to be able to protect themselves. How do we do that? Uh, is this our individual problem? Do we have to install other software? How, do, how should this software look like? And so on and so on, right? Okay, so this is a kind of an ongoing uh, project still. Um, although, you know, uh, crypto software, of course, uh, is very old. Uh, and uh, the so-called PGP software, of course, is already uh, more than, uh, more than 20, 20 years old. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, another aspect is uh, what you, maybe you are quite familiar with, is this critique of the creative industries. Uh, I already told you a little bit about it. Um, everyone in the creative uh, and in the cultural sector needs to be, uh, become uh, like an entrepreneur, and needs to have a company, and so on and so on. You need to work for commercial clients. <clears throat> um, so uh, this has been a, a threat throughout uh, our activities. And it, but it, it is not really a network, but it's more like a, a topic that keeps coming back. The focus on precarious labor. Uh, and these days, this is done primarily uh, by um, our Italian um, uh, friend and web designer. His name is Silvio, Silvio Lorusso. And uh, the, on our website, he has this blog called Enter Precariat. 
Enter precariat is of course a, a mixture between entrepreneurialism or enter, yeah, and the precariat uh, circumstances, right? So the enter precariat, uh, that's uh, that's us, uh, and uh, so it, for us it's important to uh, to theorize uh, because yeah, you are part <coughs> of that class as well. Um, I don't have to. <clears throat> go into that. Okay. <clears throat> after after that, in uh, 13 or 14, and this is our newer projects, and, uh, and this is Money Lab. Here you see um, uh, Money Lab number three. Uh, we just had Money Lab number six last week in uh, Siegen in Germany. <clears throat> so on the on the website, you will find a lot of uh, reports uh, about this event. Money Lab is focusing on the question of how artists are going to make a living in the 21st century. So, uh, and we are looking at very, very different approaches uh, from, from crowdfunding uh, to, uh, let's say, Patreon type of subscription based uh, uh, software uh, uh, solutions, uh, and of course, uh, bit, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrencies, and the blockchain are an important part. And um, all this is done through the work of art artists and designers, right? So, so this, is this is an art project, uh, but yeah, yeah um, I don't know. Uh, so we, we are primarily focusing on uh, how artists look at this uh, environment. Um, I brought uh, the Money Lab uh, reader uh, here for you. So, um, because, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly where the library is, but um, anyway, uh, there's a copy uh, for you here. Uh, you can also order a free copy, uh, uh, and then you get it in the mail. So if you want to have uh, this book, you can uh, go to the website, and then uh, we send it to you. Um, okay. Uh, so that's Money Lab. Uh, another one, a uh, smaller project that we very much like, um, that has just started uh, two years ago, around two years ago, and, and that's this one on the, on the politics um, uh, and the aesthetics of the online self. Hmm? You could say it's uh, selfie studies, uh, which I don't mind. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the selfie, so I don't mind uh, to call it like that, but of course the selfie is much bigger. Right? Well, selfie is not only like, oh, I take a picture of myself, right? Uh, there's, of course, a lot more um, uh, than that. Uh, of course, there is the whole uh, like economy that is connected to the selfie, right? Because the, the selfie is not uh, anymore an isolated digital object, right? It's embedded in, in the social media networks and has its currencies and so on and so on, right? So, uh, uh, so yeah, the, and, 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 um, so it's important. The online self is a very, very important uh, topic, not only for young people, but uh, for for everybody uh, involved. Uh, that even includes, um, let's say, um, um, yeah, parts of the of the previous story that I said about the crypto design. Because uh, the crypto design is, of course, for us, one of the many ways to talk about what we call mask design, right? How do we mask ourselves? Uh, is that only by, uh, you know, uh, by protecting ourselves or by creating another identity? Uh, uh, this is an important question. Um, and how, is the, how can you do mask design in an age when... Uh, Everybody can find out who you are, and so on and so on. Right. So this is a this is a this is a problem. Okay. So that's the that's mm, yeah. Maybe this is a newer thing. It's not yet a, uh, let's say a, a really full fully fledged uh, network uh, as of yet. Uh, yeah. What is uh, our main activities in terms of funding? Is that we are we became very good at uh, at publishing. 
So may, maybe you know us or from some of the publications, uh, some of the digital publications. We have now have many f different formats, and I want to uh, ask you, uh, you know, to uh, to contribute. If you want, if you want, you can contact us. You can send us material, and uh, we can look uh, if we can work with you to publish it. Uh, so this this is our our task. And we have many uh, kind of many forms in, in, uh, in which we do this. Uh, the publishing lab used to be uh, one. Uh, now there is a, 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 a conference coming up between three art schools in the Netherlands. It's called uh, Urgent Publishing. Uh, we do that together with Arnhem, Nishan Shah is there, and Florian Kramer in, in Rotterdam at the Piet Zwart. Uh, Willem de Koning. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a collaboration, and we are looking at new forms of uh, of publishing. And so this is a uh, this is where we have uh, money for research money, and m many of the interns that come to Amsterdam are in fact working uh, on uh, on those uh, uh, you know possibilities. Hmm? Uh, maybe you've heard about uh, maybe our long forms or our long reads. Uh, we publish a, a series called uh, Theory on Demand, which is kind of a print-on-demand series. Okay, uh, to summarize this, this is kind of our philosophy, if you like. Uh, so this is uh, how, how we work. So we create these networks, and uh, the, these networks come together, and, um, and we create some kind of uh, publication. Uh, but publication, you must see, as a very broad thing, right? Publication is always much more uh, than uh, just a paper version, especially these days. Uh, you can do uh, publications in, uh, in so, many different, uh, so many different ways. In, uh, recently, uh, we have specialized, for instance, in uh, EPUB. I don't know if you are designing EPUBs here, but yeah, we know that a lot of, especially young people, read our stuff on the, on the smartphone, right? And uh, so it's important uh, that uh, our material becomes accessible uh, on the smartphone. And we do that through uh, the EPUB um, software. Okay. I'll close this uh, now with my, the, I'll tell you a little bit about my own work. Uh, so um, I'm running the center, but at the same time I'm, I'm also uh, uh, publishing books. So this is, uh, this is one from, uh, from 2012, it's called Networks Without a Cause. Uh, here you can see some of the, the topics, and there you can already see some of the you know, the topics uh, of the networks I, I spoke about, right? So a lot of it is focused on the social media critique, on aesthetics, internet aesthetics. Maybe I'm not dealing so much with net art or, or post-digital art. I'll leave that up to my uh, my uh, art critics' uh, friends, uh, uh, although you know I I know them very well and I'm I'm part of it, but I don't feel uh, you know the necessity to uh, to write about um, those issues. Uh, um, I I don't mind. Uh, we publish them, yes, but I I don't feel like it's my task. Uh, to necessarily uh, contribute uh, to it. Maybe it will be your task uh, to, uh, you know, speculate what comes after uh, post-digital or something like that. Mm? Uh, or uh, <clears throat> if you are, a, you know, a accelerationist or not, I don't, uh, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Um, then uh, the next one uh, is uh, Social Media Abyss. Uh, and uh, this one, um, um, by the way, these books come out in different uh, languages, right? It's not English only, but um, <coughs> there's one book uh, with uh, my writings in Romanian, uh, but it's from, uh, if I remember well, from 2003, and it kind of looks back more 
on my, uh, on my writings uh, about the 90s. So, um, and uh, so, yeah, that's already a long time ago, 2003. Yeah, at least 15 years ago. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I, I haven't had a, a publication um, uh, since then um, in Romania. Okay, here you can see uh, the, um, uh, the table of content of uh, the social media abyss with a lot of uh, kind of, uh, you know, the, the question of the money lab and uh, the question of how, uh, um, how financialization and monetization uh, is going to affect and is going to be integrated into the internet, right? Because that's uh, as we speak. Uh, we see we are not yet there, uh, so we, we, we can't speak about a full integration. Uh, uh, we are still in the, in the, early, in the early days uh, uh, with that. Okay, um, and, then, uh, and then there is uh, this uh, book. And this is the, uh, this is the uh, upcoming uh, book, Sad by Design. And um, yeah, this comes out in German, uh, Italian, Spanish, and English uh, in a couple of months. And uh, here you can see uh, the the table of content. Uh, again, a lot of emphasis on uh, on the question of uh, of social media uh, critique and uh, analysis. Um, I also deal here, uh, as you can see, uh, with uh, the question of the selfie, the mask design, uh, the memes, and uh, I close um, this book with a discussion about the commons, commoning, and this uh, issue uh, from, an, from an internet uh, uh, perspective. Uh, yeah. So an important uh, kind of uh, key chap uh, chapter here uh, that I just briefly want to say something about, that's this one. And this has also to do a little bit with my own Werdegang, as they say in German, uh, with my own um, you know, history uh, of how I developed uh, myself. And I describe the, the move here from media, media theory, um, to the networks, of course, in the 90s and beyond, to uh, today, uh, where uh, we are dealing with platforms, right? And how these three key terms uh, relate uh, to, to each other, right? The media theory, the network theory and the network cultures and the platform capitalism that uh, we are living in uh, right now. Okay, so this is kind of also describes maybe a, a development of uh, 30 years of uh, thinking uh, uh, about this uh, field. Um, Maybe Joseph, uh, I think he said something about it, but uh, it, it is, yeah, known that I'm not just uh, dealing with the internet and with uh, the aesthetics, but I also come from an activist background, from the social movements. And um, so the question of how to organize um, yourself uh, is for me uh, really very closely related to um, to the um, uh, question of um, of the internet and the networks, right? Mm. Uh, this uh, this is a, a book that came out last in uh, eighteen. I have it here uh, for the for the department for you. Um, so if you want to read it, uh, it's also online, by the way, uh, as a PDF. So if you want to. Um, Copy, uh, copy it or read it. It's freely downloadable. It's, it's maybe my first, let's say, regular book 
that you can buy in the bookstore and download for free officially <laughs> uh, uh, as a PDF. So, so that is also interesting. It was very interesting for me uh, to work for the first time with a small publisher uh, who was willing to take that risk and say, okay, uh, huh? from, from the beginning uh, this book is free uh, on the net, but you can also, for a small price, buy the paper copy. Yeah, so that was uh, interesting. Um, I wrote this book together with my friend Ned Rossiter uh, from, from Sydney. And uh, since uh, 2001, I have been uh, collaborating with him. And uh, together we uh, developed the concept called organized networks. And uh, organized networks are an answer, let's say, to the weak links uh, that we are confronted with in the social media. Eh? And you know the difference. Eh? It's one of the key, uh, let's say, terms in network uh, theory eh? uh, be between the, the difference between the weak links. Eh? You are the friend of a friend of a friend, right? Eh? And this is how Mark Zuckerberg built up uh, his empire uh, by sucking in all your address uh, books uh, and um, um, making connections um, uh, between uh, uh, people, right? Maybe you remember that. Some, uh, some social media still do it. Uh, they still uh, ask you to download uh, and to give them your entire address book. Um, Although I think today, uh, yeah, people would not find that so uh, self-evident anymore. Anyway, uh, it has happened, and uh, uh, so um, uh, Google and Facebook uh, would not uh, have existed um, uh, without uh, this uh, principle of, uh, of the weak link. Okay, so... Uh, we have, uh, in opposition to this, developed this theory uh, of, uh, of the organized network. Uh, the network that is based on strong links, um, uh, but is still a network, right? So in that sense, uh, it differs really radically, let's say, from the collective or the NGO, or civil society organization, for that matter, or political party, of course, but even of uh, the social movement. Uh, we could say from the social movement, often people uh, define the social movement as a, a network of networks, right? Uh, so where uh, a social movement comes into existing when there is a critical mass of people somehow working in a similar, uh, similar direction and organizing themselves and then they need a spark in order to uh, come together and manifest themselves, as has happened here in Romania also recently, maybe, yeah. anyway. Uh, um, you, you probably know uh, what, what, I'm, um, what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so... Um, uh, in all my work, in every book, in every uh, um, uh, project, we ask this basic question. Uh, is how do we organize ourselves? Um, and how do we make use of this fact that today uh, we are living in, uh, in uh, networks that are distributed, that are uh, often um, centralized, yes, uh, but they're also decentralized. They're local uh, and they are dispersed. And how do you come together in, in a situation like that, right? Okay, so this is, uh, this is more like a, uh, also a political and a strategic question, but uh, in my uh, understanding is also very relevant and uh, urgent uh, in, the, in the art world. Okay. Um, so, I want to have a very short break before I go to the second part of my lecture and I want to ask uh, if there's uh, any uh, question or if you want to 
uh, say something um, about it. I want to give you my name card because then you can contact me, you can call me or uh, write an email or uh, whatever. Um, and um, uh, you can, um, <coughs> it has the website on it and I think even my Twitter address, uh, although I don't know how long that's gonna last, but um, yeah. So, um, thank you. And uh, we, are, uh, we are really uh, focused on, um, uh, you know, on collaborations. And um, so if you, for instance, if you wanna say, well, can you help me with the, the thesis or something like that, this is what we do. Huh? So that's our work. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, um, because uh, you know that's how uh, uh, that's how we uh, how we work. So, do you have any uh, remarks or questions uh, about the things I've uh, presented so far? Please say something. <laughs> Okay. Because it's a kind of a completely decentralized uh, system. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Could, uh, Invisible, at least for more, for most. Uh, yeah. 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 Cor and, correct. Uh, so it's a, another possible uh, thing to relate because it's related to. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in general, I think a lot of the. Um, let's say, art projects, networks, and even activist ones, they do not relate so much to the dark web. Because we have already uh, viable uh, alternatives to the dark web. Uh, and, I mean, that's, it's important to state. Uh, because the dark web, I think, is uh, you know, has this problem that it it um, it is by and large dominated by you know criminal activities. Mm? So um, not only not only no okay no no but I think it, it is important to see how uh, people uh, have developed other uh, let's say means. Uh, to uh, express the same uh, problems, uh, because we are not talking about the dark web, we are talking about peer-to-peer -peer communities, for instance. Uh, so, yeah, that it, it's, a, it's a whole other way of, um, of uh, looking at it. Eh? And we, we don't call peer-to-peer -peer communities uh, the dark web. Eh? Although, you know, uh, maybe for some, eh? Uh, this is uh, this is the case. Um, yeah, and also I, I have to say that um, um, we would like to stress uh, the resilience uh, not of the criminal underground activities, but uh, of very strong offline uh, 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 connections. Mm -hmm. Offline connections become more and more uh, important. So, um, and um, in a way that, uh, you know, the online is becoming more uh, under scrutiny, more surveilled, more uh, policed. Uh, we know that the offline, uh, you know, has a lot of uh, potential. So, um, uh, next door, in the other room, there's a computer uh, at the moment uh, working very busy uh, for you. <laughs> uh, because uh, I brought an offline library for, for everybody here. Um, uh, it's called the Alexandria Project. 
uh, and it consists of uh, 50,000 uh, books, all in PDF form, uh, in English, I have to say. Um, and uh, so the, 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 of the Alexandria Library uh, is an example uh, of uh, a uh, peer-to-peer, uh, let's say, offline uh, connection between people. Right? This library you cannot find anywhere uh, online. Of course, there is ARC, uh, there is uh, uh, Monoscope, and uh, a few websites that um, you know, uh, have a similar uh, um, content. But these websites are usually quite unstable. Either you can't reach them, or then you try to find it, and then it's not there anymore, and so on and so on. So, so for us, the online is, uh, is, the, uh, is the precarious uh, one. Um, I want to just briefly show you uh, something about it. Um, because I'm doing this together with uh, a person in Toronto. His name is Henry Work. And um, we have developed uh, this uh, Alexandria project uh, together. Every year uh, we issue uh, a new version uh, of the library. So every year uh, yeah, we add a few thousand more books, or something like that. So we are not uh, very actively looking, but you know, the, the content comes in and the, the, the library is growing uh, steadily. The library of 50,000 books uh, is mainly art history, philosophy, uh, media theory and uh, social science, okay? So it's kind of, uh, yeah, uh, so a, a kind of classics uh, and what, it's a library what young people like, like to read. Uh, because they send a lot of the books again to us, so and then we add them uh, to to the library. And um, uh, you can uh, see uh, this is this is a film. I'm, I'm not going to uh, um, show the entire piece, but you can uh, watch it online. So this is a film that explains the Alexandria project, right? And it's on the computer in the next room. It started off as a conversation between myself and Herod Loving several years ago. I was working on a PhD about post-carbon ICT, and one of my research indicated that there was no such thing as He asked me what I was up to otherwise, and I explained my musical interests and how I was collecting e-books online and building my own library to help with my PhD research. And he said, that's your PhD. He said, you spent your professional career democratizing digital media, fonts, internet design, digital video, and digital music, and now you're building a library. And I said, yeah, that's right. Uh, note here that uh, he says, uh, you know, where he worked, he's from San Francisco originally. There's a very interesting uh, firm here <laughs> showing up. Uh, he is one of the few uh, employees of Napster. <laughs> so, so in the early 2000s, before the company was closed by uh, law enforcement, uh, <laughs> uh, so he worked, uh, he worked at Napster. So, um, so that, that is a little bit, uh, let's say, of a background, which, uh, you know, here uh, in this video, he very politely calls uh, the democratization of, uh, of fonts and uh, media. Anyway, uh, maybe you know the history of Napster, right? Napster was this huge uh, kind of trading um, zone for, uh, for free MPEG-3s uh, before, um, you know, before iTunes, before uh, Spotify and so on and so on, right? Didn't last very long. In fact, only a couple of months. <laughs> but <laughs> in those couple of months, a lot was exchanged. Maybe you, uh, well, anyway. Um, so, in some further discussion, I came up with the idea of the Alexandria, which would be a library on a hard drive that people could share, contribute to, edit, and otherwise help educate so that, each other. Because the original purpose of the library was learning. So this this uh, uh, this drive is uh, is now here and. Uh, 
um, at the end of this class you will have a, a copy and then you you can make if you're interested a copy of the copy yeah so that's how how it works with uh, the offline library it also became clear that many other people were thinking similar thoughts I found a certain set of facts that were important in this regard. One, that libraries existed to copy data, and that libraries as warehouses was a recent idea, and not a very good one. Two, that the online world used to be considered rhizomatic, but recent events have proven that it is actually quite arboretic and precarious. We'll get into that in a little bit. Three, that a method of sharing files using hard drives is slow, but it's extremely resilient and that this reversalism is a radical tactic against draconian proprietarianism. Four, there are forces in transit work that are working against personal portable libraries, and we'll talk about those too. First, let's talk about libraries. Libraries started in ancient Mesopotamia, where clay tablets were collected. Clay tablets are pretty cool. If you treat them well, they can last thousands of years. That's why we know about them today. But if you drop one, it is prone to shatter, which means that it's really important that you always have more than one copy of something around. Because if it breaks, you can copy the copy and have another backup to work from. Because these things broke with some frequency, the library became a big copy center. After that, the next big library, Alexandria Library, which was actually two libraries, but we'll talk about it as one. The Alexandria library was also a gigantic copy center because their documents were on scrolls made of papyrus, which tended to rot when wet or crumble when dry. So copies had to be made to manage the natural decay of the papyrus. It was also a huge copy center because the people who ran Alexandria, the Ptolemaic dynasty, were very aggressive about adding to the library, such that if you sailed to Alexandria, your boat would be searched, and any scrolls of note or value were confiscated, copied, and the copies were then given to the owners. This practice made Alexandria the biggest library ever. It got to be so big, they had to organize it, so they set up tables for different subjects of interest in the library, from philosophy to cookbooks to physics and history. These tables were the ancestor of database tables. Anyway, Ptolemy got greedy and decided to restrict the export of papyrus, and this resulted in the development of parchment, which led to the invention of books to replace scrolls. Alexandria burned down a few times, and much was lost. In the interim, China and the Near East built libraries, and the monks and monasteries in European scriptoria all set about copying books. In China, India, and the Near East, they copied books of history, wisdom, and philosophy, and well as religion. In Europe, they tended to copy the Bible. This was slow and expensive, and production was limited, but this wasn't so bad because Europe was mostly illiterate anyway. Europe also had a belief in patron saints. There were saints for sailors, tailors, butchers, farmers, animals, anyone who needed protection, but not for copyists. <laughs> copyists had a patron demon named Tetevillus. He would distract the copyist who would make distract, mistakes. Right? His mistakes were always made. He'd have a patron demon to blame and a patron saint to protect. Anyway, hackers also have a patron saint, Saint Expedite. Since hackers have a patron saint for protection, then it makes sense for digital copyists to have one, and that would be Metatron, the recording angel. Metatron. And the tip of the hat to Saul Uric. So with the protection of Metatron, let us proceed to the next point. The development of movable type in Europe, which was copied from China, led to massive increases in literacy and the production of books other than the Bible. But books were still expensive and slow to produce until well into the 19th century when they developed pulp paper and rotary presses, another idea that had originated in China. But pulp paper changed all that. It allowed for the development and printing of countless millions of books, magazines, journals, advertisements, etc. And it all came at the price of mowing down jillions of square miles of forest. This amplification of book production. Libraries changed character and became warehouses that existed at the luxury of those who owned the publishing rights to the books. But all that is relatively recent. If we look at the lunatic copyright laws of today, that have only really been around since the 1970s, and compare them to the tablets of Mesopotamia, say 2000 BCE, you can see that the warehouse library of today is a stunted, dull anomaly at a time of greed and excess rather than the center of learning in the millennia of copying and collecting that had been going on previously. 
In this way, those making and collecting personal portable libraries are much more in the tradition of the historical norm of library development. Even in the 20th century, there has been personal portable libraries. An example would be Walter Benjamin, who carted trunks full of books around with him, or stuck a box or two to bring with him for research. All of his books and writings could have fit on a USB stick today. If he had that, perhaps history might have turned out differently. But he died decades before USB sticks were invented. In 1989, Andrew Tenenbaum said, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurtling down the highway. Well, nowadays we can say, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of multi-terabyte hard drives hurtling down the highway. That is the promise inherent to the personal portable library, and it is a radical promise. <clears throat> yep, hey, goedemorgen. Hey. Nee, ik ben in Boekarest in Roemenië en ik ben nu les aan het geven. Maar uh, ik ben maandagochtend weer terug. Hm? Hm? Ja, dat is goed. Oké, okay, tot maandag. Ja? ja, ik kom even langs maandag. Ook om even te vertellen hoe het gaat. Oké, okay, tot dan. Uh, you know, there are uh, a few people uh, working on this uh, more systematically than we do. Um, I would like to mention uh, Marcel Maus here, who is originally from um, uh, Zagreb, from uh, a place called Mama. Uh, and um, uh, for instance, uh, he uh, is in the possession of the, of the largest um, library that um, I know of. So of course not everybody has such a, a vast library. Again, you know, our uh, version of it is only in English. It's only 50,000 books. Um, uh, his uh, versions are primarily Russian, Spanish, but also Chinese. Uh, and the, the, the latest version of his library uh, indeed uh, tops the uh, Library of Congress uh, in Washington uh, and he has now uh, more than 35 million uh, 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 books um, available of course uh, on various drives because they cannot be stored uh, on, on one drive, right? Um, another uh, activity that is happening, uh, done by uh, the same group of people, uh, is to uh, build uh, another version of these libraries, uh, and that's uh, uh, related to uh, films, feature films and documentaries, right? Uh, the first time I heard about it was probably in France a couple of years ago. I was in an art school, and uh, there somebody made um, a library of 7,000 films. At the time, that was, uh, that was uh, considerable. Um, um, and uh, nowadays, um, there's a, a group in Berlin, maybe you've heard about them, and they're called um, uh, Pirate Cinema. And um, it's run by uh, a guy called uh, Sebastian Lüdgert uh, and some others. And uh, they are creating similar uh, libraries uh, of, uh, of uh, films. Um, so, um, yeah, unfortunately I don't have uh, uh, those, I, on, my, I only have my own uh, uh, collection, which is uh, a couple, like maybe you as well, a couple of, uh, you know, dozens of films, not, not very many. Uh, but uh, I, I am interested, um, and I'm talking with him, uh, 
to create um, or to curate, I have to say, uh, a similar um, kind of size uh, of, uh, of film library, um, probably in the range of, uh, let's say, an ordinary three terabyte drive, right? That, that you can still travel with uh, and take to other places and then, and then uh, copy. Uh, so, um, but that's still uh, something uh, in the making because obviously uh, the size of, uh, you know, you, you know very well, the size of an ordinary film is still, well, half, like one gig, uh, gigabyte. So, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a different magnitude. You, you could also say, well, the world hasn't produced that many films yet. Uh, so, in, in comparison uh, to books and, uh, and manuscripts, uh, we still have a, a long way to go in that, in that sense. But uh, it, it is very uh, interesting, I think, also for the, uh, for the context of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, an, uh, of an art academy and uh, a place like this, uh, you know, that we start to think of uh, building such uh, comprehensive um, uh, digital libraries also for um, uh, for for films and documentaries, okay. Now, uh, if if you don't have, yeah, go yes. ahead, go ahead. Uh. Yes, very interesting everything you say to us, and maybe we will talk more after the after the after you show us the library. There's a lot to talk about. Very useful to us, but I I just want to make a mention from the movie where it was saying that in Europe, uh, in, in the past, compared to Asia and, uh, I don't know, China and the uh, mm -hmm. Middle East, uh, we had just the Bible and they had... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the truth is that uh, only the monastic medium uh, had the culture, had the libraries in, uh, in Europe. Yeah. So, just that. It's unrelated, but uh, it's kind of important. Yeah, and, and of course it's not entirely true because a very small part of the Greek philosophy kind of survived uh, in some in some libraries, right? And but they were kept there and they didn't circulate. And it was only in the in the in the late mid medieval times that uh, the circulation of knowledge really started to uh, uh, you know pick up uh, momentum again uh, in um, in Europe, right? I mean. Uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, for for that. Okay, uh, now uh, I want to uh, come to the last uh, part of my presentation here, uh, which is uh, I'll read some parts of uh, of this um, uh, chapter uh, in my book, uh, and it's called uh, "Sad by Design." Um, I have developed this, uh, oh, of course, over time. Um, it, uh, there are other traces in my work going back uh, to this. Uh, in previous books, I have, for instance, dealt uh, with uh, earlier phenomena. Uh, for instance, the one called information overload. It's a concept, for instance, that Howard Rheingold uh, you know, one of the, the gurus of the, the Silicon Valley um, um, hippie culture uh, of cyber culture uh, in the 1970s and 80s um, has, has dealt uh, with this in his, uh, in his earlier uh, writings as, as well. So the, the responses, the physical and uh, emotional responses to inf information overload uh, has, uh, were already known uh, in the uh, in 90s and um, uh, so maybe 10, 15 years ago uh, people started uh, uh, to write about it. Um, there's another uh, um, uh, aspect that I wrote about before uh, and th that's also in this book uh, uh, Sad by Design uh, which is uh, the question of, uh, of distraction. And uh, uh, the question of uh, are we all uh, distracted? Uh, um, how do we deal with it? Uh, it's also a question of uh, you know how do you manage uh, 
the uh, multitasking, I don't know, the, the, the debate about multitasking is not so uh, prominent uh, anymore. Uh, it was uh, five, ten years ago. Uh, it was uh, quite uh, a thing, like how many things can you have open at the same time? Can you work on simultaneously and so on and so on? How many uh, media of these multimedia can you have and manage, right? Uh, while uh, they are happening at the same time. Uh, so, uh, so these, these are kind of uh, predecessors uh, uh, for me. Uh, um, but uh, I started to notice that, uh, yeah, it, 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 the dependency, um, uh, which is a kind of a, a medical term uh, of the social media became very, very uh, apparent. Uh, the always-on uh, phenomena uh, has been uh, there, uh, so the online world uh, it existed for a long time. Um, but uh, what is uh, now uh, really, really different is that we carry these media with us uh, in the form of a smartphone on us very, very, um, uh, in a very small size. And uh, it is uh, now becoming a very intimate uh, medium, just because of that very uh, reason, that it's small and we carry it on us, it's on, on uh, day and night, um, and uh, that um, uh, has kind of accelerated uh, this, um, uh, yeah, this thinking uh, about uh, where we are. Right? Um, I also very much uh, associate sad by design uh, with uh, the fact that uh, in this uh, platform capitalism, it is no longer really possible uh, to, uh, to escape. You cannot, you cannot freely um, uh, go to another uh, medium, right? We are locked in. And uh, a lot of people uh, experience it, this, this lock-in uh, phenomena, also in a very uh, a personal and emotional way. Uh, so, uh, so we cannot, and, and young people experience this uh, to a lot, uh, an extreme extent, they cannot leave Facebook, they cannot delete apps, they cannot, right, because they feel uh, they commit social suicide. And there's uh, a lot to be said uh, for that, right? So, um, so the, the lock-in effect is a very, very real uh, phenomena. We cannot just, uh, you know, from a rational or a political perspective say, oh, please, you know, go ahead, get over it, <laughs> uh, yeah, move on, yeah. Uh, this idea that we can move on uh, is simply no longer uh, the case, uh, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, so that made, uh, made me uh, think about uh, you know, what the, the psychological um, uh, then, uh, response uh, is uh, when, when you are exposed to this for longer uh, periods of times. Uh, let's say really months, if not years. Um, and um, yeah, that um, made me write this, uh, this text. It, uh, it is, by the way, online. If you want to read uh, it, or at least a version of it, uh, it's on a website from Vienna called eurozine.com. Eurozine. So uh, there you find the, f the full essay called uh, Sad by Design. This text uh, consists of uh, some an analysis uh, that uh, and observations that I made, but uh, it also has another part that I'm not going to de deal with or read from uh, here in this uh, in this lecture, and that is the actual sad by design uh, examples. But you you all know these examples more or less. Uh, and that is uh, how uh, the, uh, the Silicon Valley engineers have introduced behavioral science methods in order to uh, keep people online, to keep them addicted, to keep them coming back to the phone time and again, right? And especially in the last years around uh, the scandal of Cambridge Analytica, and in fact, uh, three or four months before that, that a lot of these engineers came out, like in a confessional mode, 
like really Californian mode uh, of, uh, of doing, like uh, I committed something bad and I'm going to now confess what I did, right? In that way. And there are a lot of those um, uh, um, uh, confessions uh, online you can find of those engineers that actually designed these um, uh, addictive tools. And I, in, in, this, uh, in this essay, uh, I'm writing about WhatsApp, about Tinder, uh, about Snapchat, and so on, so on, right? So there are, uh, but, so there is a lot of evidence already coming from the engineers, coming from the designers who, who actually put this together, right? And so the sad by design is not, uh, is not just a joke or a nice word, right? Uh, it is uh, a variation, as you may know, on uh, you know, a, a few uh, earlier uh, concepts, and the most important one there is Addiction by Design. Addiction by Design is a book that came out in 2017, and it, uh, it is a, it's an, a comprehensive history of the design of Las Vegas um, gambling slot machines. Right? where uh, the, the person had showed how the design of these machines work, that you go back to them and put in more and more money and so on and so on. Right? So that book is called Addiction by Design. Huh? Um, and um, so I uh, wrote more or less uh, a variation uh, of that, which I'm going to read now. Um, try and dream if you can of a morning app. The mobile has come dangerously close to our psychic bone, to the point where the two can no longer be separate. If only my phone could gently weep. McLuhan's extension of man has imploded right into the exhausted self. Social media and the psyche have fused, turning daily life into a social reality that, much like artificial and virtual reality, is overtaking our perception of the world and its inhabitants. Social reality is a corporate hybrid between handheld media and the psychic structure of the user, right? So social reality, I call that. Of course, it's a, it's a reference to, uh, I'm very influenced by Italian thinkers, uh, they no longer speak about uh, social media. They uh, have already made the shortcut. They talk about social. Are you on social, right? So uh, uh, social meaning social media, right? So they already express this, uh, this completely uh, impossibility uh, to, decide, to um, make a difference between society and the social in the classic sense once defined by sociology, and the social media, and the way social media architecture is des designed by, uh, social, uh, by Silicon Valley are uh, defining uh, our uh, modes of communication, and in a way, our sense of uh, community. As op online subjects, we are too implicit, far too deeply involved. Social reality, works in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. It's all about you and your profile. Likes and followers define your social status. But what happens when nothing can motivate you anymore? When all the self-optimization techniques fail and you begin to carefully avoid these forms of e emotional analytics? Compared to others, your ranking is low. And this makes you sad. Of course, sadness already existed before social media. And even when the smartphone is safely out of reach, you can still feel down and out. Let's step out of the determinist merry-go-round that all too quickly spins from capitalist alienation and disastrous states of mind to blaming Silicon Valley for your misery. Even technological sadness is a style, but a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. This is what happens 
when you can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. And what happens when the other is not responding? This drives us mad. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the brief in-between in moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of the current situation and onto another playing field filled with many reports we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media claim, uh, places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're all sad in our very own way. And there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore. The result is fatigue, depletion and loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed while waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time, meticulously uh, measured on every app, tells it right into our face. Kronos hurts, right? Should I post something to attract uh, the attention of the other and show I'm still there? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog culture try to update the diary form of the online realm. But that moment has now passed, right? Blogs are simply too slow. They, 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 they archive something and you know, who reads blogs uh, anymore these days, right? Um, if, you, if you can um, ex exchange uh, messages um, um, at the speed of light. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed, surpassed the summary stage of the diary, right, that looks back and reflects in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real-time regime. Instagram stories, for instance, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day, like a revenge act a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on, right? So this is kind of also an irony of our age that um, even though we have m more and more capacity for storage, we rather, you know, prevent to store uh, our lives, right? So, um, uh, and um, this is why, uh, yeah, this contrast with uh, the blog writing of the Web 2.0 in comparison to the social media now um, is uh, interesting for me. It's easy to contrast the relentless swing between phone and life with the way anthropologists once described metamorphosis. Initiation and ritual are slow events that require time, instigated by periods of voluntary solitude. And so there is no time for initiation anymore in today's society, which is uh, important because initiation is what happens when you're young. Uh, and when you're young nowadays, you're uh, using these social media to an extreme. Uh, extent, right? So there's a, there's a, a let's say, a, an initiation crisis. The perpetual now that de defines the smart condition is anything but an endurance test. By browsing through the updates, we're catching up with machine time, at least until we collapse under the weight of participation fatigue. 
organic life cycles are short-circuited and accelerated up to a point where the personal life of billions has finally caught up with cybernetics. And so this is uh, uh, important to uh, note that uh, uh, because of this pressure, there are temporary uh, kind of setbacks. And it is in, that, in, in those moments of the void that this uh, short um, feeling or this state of mind of sadness comes up. But it's very uh, shallow and it's short because uh, very soon after something else uh, comes in and overrides this feeling, right? So this is, uh, this is important uh, to note. Uh, so sadness is, for me is a general uh, condition, but it's a very flat one. It's a very uh, thin one. Uh, and it is uh, not a medical condition, right? So I compare in this essay the sadness with uh, boredom, but boredom is not a medical condition, right? You cannot go to a doctor and say, I'm bored. Huh? Uh, uh, no. Uh, so uh, you, you, you can uh, not even go to a doctor and say, uh, well, it, it depends. Okay. Uh, I'm melancholic. Maybe, yeah, maybe. That maybe they can say, okay, you can go to the therapist. But uh, um, th there are, of course, a lot of very uh, more heavy uh, symptoms that are related to the uh, phenomena that I describe here, right? And they're very well known to you. Burnout, suicide, depression, right? And these are all, of course, within the realm uh, of the medical. Eh? But uh, uh, the, the thing that, uh, let's say, Facebook, Google, and all the others are studying eh? uh, and are exploiting in Silicon Valley, they are not medical. Right? Yeah? They are something else. They, they, uh, they are uh, operating on a different level of our uh, existence. Right? And of course, they know that they border to these very serious medical cases, such as, in particular, of course, the burnout, uh, which is very well known, uh, uh, but also the, the depression. Right? Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm going deeper into that uh, kind of uh, question of uh, the, 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 this uh, uh, feeling or the, the design of the feeling, uh, the orchestration of, of all this. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness. Right? So it's, it's a temporary crisis, a flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. Right? So I define sadness as the possibility of a reflection. But it's not a reflection, right? because there is no time for the reflection. So this is a problem. Eh? Yeah? So a real reflection would need time. You know, in the, in, the, in the classical hermeneutic sense of the word, where you take out the different elements and you lay them out and, yeah. Uh, all this unfolds in time, as we know it, uh, the chronos. Uh, but there is no time. Uh, so this is a problem. Mm? This is, and this is the fundamental uh, issue uh, that, uh, that I'm dealing with here. So there is a possibility of a reflection, but no. Mm? So the frequently uh, used sad label is a vehicle a strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container, right? So I use it as a container. I've desi designed it as a container, more or less. And you can put all sorts of things in it. Each and every situation can uh, be qualified as sad. And I've learned this from my 16-year-old uh, son because he told me that this uh, object is very sad, right? So everything uh, is, is potentially sad, right? Everything can, can have that, uh, have, have that um, uh, uh, quality, right? Of course, uh, yeah, it's obvious why it's sad. It's plastic, uh, climate change, and so on, so on, right? We are destroying the Earth, and uh, mm? 
Yeah. So while looking at this, uh, we don't understand why are we still in this uh, kind of mm, madness and uh, why can't I do anything about it and so on and so on, right? So this is a sad object, okay? Uh, just as an, uh, a random example. Each and every situation can potentially be qualified as sad. Through this mild form of suffering, we enter the blues of being in the world. When something is sad, things around it, they are, become gray. And this is important. So um, they might be colorful, but they, they turn the uh, experience of the everyday life into a gray one. You trust the machine because you feel you're uh, in control of it. You want to go from zero to he hero, but then your propped up ego implodes and the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again, right? So it's always this up and down. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. We need to revolt against the, re the restless zombie inside us, but we don't know how. Psychic armor against the the uh, is thin, yeah? so the, our psychic armor is thin. So we, we don't have much uh, defense, uh, psychic defense uh, possibilities uh, in this case, and it's the exploitation of that thin armor that uh, you know is, is what's happening uh, and what what uh, Silicon Valley is so eagerly uh, to. Um, uh, investigate and to exploit. It's the thin psychic armor. Uh, this is a problem, right? If, if only we would uh, be uh, uh, stronger, let's say, uh, they would not have a chance. But they have found uh, these weak points, let's say. Our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to what Silicon Valley calls behavioral modifications. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world. After yet another app session in which we failed to make a date through twin Tinder, purchased a ticket online and did a quick round of online videos on YouTube, the post-dopamine mood hits us hard. The sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless. After a dive into the network, we're drained and feel socially awkward. The swiping finger is tired and we have to stop. Sadness expresses the growing gap between the self-image of a perceived social status and the actual precarious reality. The temporary dip described here under the codename sadness can be best understood as a mirror phenomena of the self-promotion machine that constructs the links for us. Right? We have to prop up that ego uh, uh, and um, you know self-image um, uh, all the time and yet uh, we fail, right? Uh, so this is, this is the problem. The mental state is so pervasive, the merging of social media with the self so total, totalizing that we see uh, the, the sadness complex as a ma manifestation, in fact, of the anti-self stage that we slip into and then walk away from. And so this, this is a, a, an important possibility. Is there something like an anti-self? The anti-climate called sadness travels with the smartphone. It's everywhere. It's considered sad when most of your friends are bots. I don't know how many of your friends are uh, bots, but um, yeah, this is uh, of course a, uh, a growing phenomenon. The conservative judgment that many friends indicate uh, a lack of character and gestalt 
fails short here, as most are machine-generated social relationships anyway, right? Machine-generated friendships. And that's what I, uh, uh, you know, talked about earlier uh, when I tried to explain the difference between the weak links and the strong links, yeah, between uh, the social media uh, and the way they operate uh, and uh, what uh, Ned and I called uh, the organized networks, right? So um, that's an uh, important uh, distinguish, uh, um, difference we can make. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression, burnout, and so on. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everyone is depressed. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition. No matter how brief and mild, sadness is the default mental state of the online billions. It's an original intensity um, and it uh, gets uh, dissipated. It seeps out, becoming a, a general atmosphere, a chronic background condition. Occasionally, for a, free, free, uh, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. A seething rage emerges. After checking for the tenth time what somebody said on Instagram, the, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable, and we put the phone away. Am I suffering from the phantom vibration symptom? Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Wouldn't it be nice if we were offline? Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we need to quit again? To go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, to arouse us, and yet we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. Once the excitement wears off, we seek distance, searching for mental detachment. The wish for an um, uh, anti-experience arises. Uh, the anti-experience which uh, Mark Greif has uh, described in his book. Uh, the reduction of feeling is, a, is an ex essential part of what Mark Greif calls the anesthetic ideology. If the experience is the habit of creation, creating isolated online moments within raw occurrence in order to safe and recount them, the desire to anesthetize experience is a kind of immune response against the stimulations uh, of another modern novelty, the total aesthetic environment, right? So we, we have to respond uh, to that. Most of our time, our eyes are glued to the screen, and it's now or never. As Gloria Estefan wrote, the sad truth is that opportunity doesn't knock twice, right? And then there's nowhere near, uh, you know, an experience you can make of that, um, uh, as in uh, the social media, right? So this is all also what pe uh, keeps people coming back to it uh, every other uh, minute, right? There is isn't uh, the possibility of an opportunity out there, right? And uh, so you could also read this as a, as a neoliberal uh, logic, if you like. Uh, so there is a possibility, a pos even a possibility uh, of a job, of a relationship, of uh, something, right? And, w and uh, uh, we desperate souls, we need to grab that possibility and we feel guilty if we put the phone away and leave this possible uh, um, uh, luck or whatever, whatever is going to happen, uh, event, uh, if we leave that uh, aside. The fear of missing out backfires. The social battery is empty and you put the phone aside. This is the moment sadness arises. It's been all too much. The intake has been pulverized and you shut down for a moment. 
poisoning him with your unanswered messages. According to Greif, and I quote, the hallmark of the conversation, of the conversion to anti-experience is a lowered threshold for eventfulness. A Facebook event is the one you're interested in, but do not attend. Uh, so this is a general definition, we all know that. So we're interested, but we do not attend. We observe others around us, yet are no longer part of the conversation. They are nature's uh, creatures in uh, the full grace of modernity. The sad truth is that you will still want to live in their world. It's just somehow seems this world has changed to exile you. Uh, so you feel excluded. You're part of it, but you're excluded. You witness it, but you're no longer part of it. And you leave the online arena and you need a bit of rest. This is an inverse movement from the constant quest for experience. That is, until we turn our heads away, grab the phone, swipe and text back. God only knows what I'd be without the app. Okay. Um, I'll uh, leave, it, uh, leave it here. Um, in, the, in the text I, I go uh, into uh, a few uh, of the, th what I consider literary theorists, uh, mainly based uh, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, by the way, or women, um, which is, uh, in my uh, understanding, no coincidence, that uh, have theorized uh, this, this dark side uh, of the 24-7 uh, uh, experience with uh, social media. And um, um, it, there, uh, I also describe in, in, the, in the text, which is now too long to go into, also the, the, the difference between the, the sad by design uh, experience in the social media age and the more historical uh, constitution of the Western subject that is uh, suffering from melancholia, right? There's a, there's a large uh, literature uh, and, um, and history, of course, about uh, melancholia going back to the, uh, to the early Greeks. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was very interesting to contrast uh, uh, these, uh, these two uh, things. Um, I also um, explain um, uh, and, and go deeply into the work of uh, Melissa Broder. And she, uh, if you are interested in this, I don't know how long you can bear, uh, you know, her tweets and so on and so on. But um, yeah, she is the, the, the really the drama queen. Um, uh, her website and her book is called So Sad Today. And uh, I'm very, very inf inf influenced uh, by uh, her um, uh, and um, uh, a, a new no novel of her is called *The Pishes*, uh, and uh, she has, has got uh, a few more uh, books uh, coming out, uh, all exploring uh, this, uh, um, let's say, uh, widely spread uh, mental uh, condition that uh, we are all uh, uh, very well uh, familiar with. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you want to, um, um, you know, oh, please, uh, I'm very interested to. Uh, hear your responses to this. Uh, you can also write to me if you like l later on. Um, and um, I want to uh, uh, f work further on in, in this, in this uh, direction, maybe not uh, necessarily under um, you know, this uh, l large umbrella of, uh, of sadness. I think sadness is a, uh, is a feeling uh, and there are many more. Uh, there's also the gender debate, which I have to uh, just to, to uh, point you to. Um, 
because a lot of people have pointed me out that uh, usually the female response to all this is sadness and that the male response to this is anger, right? So uh, where, uh, whereas the, um, uh, the, the male uh, response is uh, trolling and so on and so on, right? Uh, the female response um, uh, is one that uh, goes maybe more in introvert. Um, um, I'm not so sure uh, if I uh, agree with this. Um, uh, also taking into account how these days we think about gender and um, uh, uh, I think those ki kinds of very uh, stereotypical uh, responses uh, in my understanding are uh, no longer um, uh, really um, very accurate. Um, however, uh, I have to admit that yes, uh, um, most of the material I have used and, uh, and read uh, uh, are uh, written by, uh, by women. So uh, they are definitely uh, the uh, the experts uh, in this uh, in this field. Um, uh, although you know, I have to say that trolling then again, you know, trolling becomes really uh, much much more uh, very quickly becomes a, a concern for uh, politics, for regulation, for uh, for even uh, you know investigative. Uh, hmm? Uh, actions by uh, by uh, law departments or by by uh, police, whatever, right? Um, because trolling uh, and these forms of uh, aggression can be uh, can be policed. Huh? Whereas, uh, yeah, where are the responses? You know, to to sadness, there are no uh, responses. Even uh, even uh, even the, the medical responses to uh, to it, I have to say, are uh, very interesting, but uh, almost not uh, existing, right? Mm? Um, and uh, and this is of course because, yeah, it's very obvious um, we are not sick, right? And this is this is the problem. Uh, if you say that all social media users are somehow sick. That doesn't make any sense uh, because um, uh, this is not uh, this is not uh, the case. Mm? Um, uh, of course, this can be the case uh, in um, uh, it can be the case with uh, mm, let's say uh, the much more severe uh, uh, forms of expression that I uh, already um, listed. Uh, burnout and so on and so on, uh, but this is not the case with sadness. Okay, you are yep. sending your essay and book and uh, uh, yep. you have a kind of target in terms of age in, in time? Yeah, I mean that's interesting of course. Uh, a lot of people say that there is, a, there is an age limit. Uh, unfortunately, there's no age limit when you go down, so <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it gets worse. Uh, the, the the younger <laughs> uh, the kids are, and the, the kids are very very young these days, mm -hmm. and it, they are definitely not your generation. So, in, in fact, for the real sadness, you are already here in this audience. You're way too old. Huh? Uh, so, uh, yeah, but that's that's normal. Huh? Because uh, for this to experience, you need full full exposure to this from very early on, right? From the age that you are three, four, five years old, right? Uh, so it means that the generation that is seriously dealing with this is uh, is uh, is in fact well uh, well under twenty at the moment. But hmm? native yeah. Facebook. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, definitely, yeah. definitely. No, no, of course, Facebook, uh, the, the social media are only, uh, you know, at best uh, 10 years old, 15, uh, mm, mm, no, not really. Uh, so. And uh, do you have some particular, did you uh, observe some interesting uh, approaches from artistic? Well, I, I have <laughs> shown you all these, <laughs> all these uh, um, 
uh, images that I collected, which uh, you know, I have to say I collected them together with uh, artists that uh, uh, helped me uh, to, uh, and also that sent me their, their art projects. And uh, yeah, of course, there, there's a lot uh, about that. And uh, very likely we will see more, um, uh, you know, we will see more of it uh, in a in a little while, because this this general mood will only become more persuasive. Let's say. Yeah, mild zombie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But where do you think, if we know all these things, why are not these people accountable or these technology held accountable? Except for this incident with you know, the Congress uh, uh, hearing? Yeah. It, Earlier I said uh, you know, that uh, in the next, uh, let's say, two to five years, uh, <coughs> we will. Um, get to that point. So this is a, it's very early days for this. Uh, it's only a couple of months ago that um, um, <clears throat> a guy uh, from, uh, from the Bay Area uh, wrote this book called Hooked. And uh, in Hooked, uh, he describes all the techniques uh, that uh, you know, I'm dealing with here. Um, he's still defending it. Uh, at the same time, uh, a, a major uh, venture capital uh, investor in, in Facebook uh, who has been very close to um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has come out uh, two weeks ago uh, uh, with, a, with a major uh, you know, statement uh, testifying uh, against uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook. So, you know, this thing is in full motion. It's really unraveling uh, as, as we speak. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, the beginnings lie somewhere in, um, in uh, late 17. So, we are now, yeah, we're not even one and a half years into it. Right? So before late 17, there was very, very, almost nothing known about this, right? Nothing. Uh, so, um, yeah, and it's even for me, it's difficult to, uh, at this moment, uh, to catch up with it. I'm trying here to theorize it, okay? And I'm doing that in a very, let's say, European uh, way, okay? That's my background, um, and... Uh, yeah. I, I'm not a Silicon Valley journalist, or uh, <clears throat> uh, however, um, I depend on on these uh, on these uh, testimonies uh, very much, uh, and in the in the piece I also refer to them wherever I wherever I can. Of course, up to November, because in November I stopped working on this uh, essay. And since November, I have uh, again <laughs> found an enormous amount uh, more. 
So it's, it's kind of developing as we speak. No, well, there are, there is no uh, alternative. The, what we what we see is uh, is that in in very very small uh, subsections, let's say of the of its functionality, we can we can look at uh, uh, alternatives, right? Um, of course, I really uh, for a longer period of time I showed you society of the query, uh, so. Yes, uh, in the realm of, uh, of search engines, for instance, there is already uh, this quite well-developed model of um, DuckDuckGo. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's something. Okay, but you could say, okay, but search has been <laughs> yeah, with us now for uh, a good 20 years, right? It, it, it is that slow. Um, what is definitely... Um, happening is that there are functioning uh, alternatives to messaging uh, and I've, I've listed here of course uh, telegram and, and signal and, and they are uh, widely used uh, maybe even uh, here right uh, uh, um, the facebook the social media uh, or the social networking uh, uh, this is the original term remember social networking uh, uh, and there, uh, there are no um, uh, real uh, viable alternatives uh, at that level yet. However, there are experiences, and funny enough, they go back seven years ago, namely in the, in the tumultuous year of 2011. And that's the year of uh, the Arab Spring, Occupy, the movement of the squares in Spain, and so on and so on, right? Remember. Okay, so in that year, a lot of kind of social networking alternatives were developed. However, they could not, not even in Europe, not even inside the movements or in the, in the arts, they could not really um, uh, sustain uh, themselves, unfortunately. And then on top of that came Snowden and the whole, uh, you know, kind of almost paralyzing idea that uh, we have to encrypt everything we do which is a, a real challenge I can tell you so the debate amongst us how we relate to encryption is yet you know it's completely open and I would like to add that anger it's also sadness but it's non accepted sadness <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps yeah. it's a very good definition I like that <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting somehow that uh, <coughs> several pioneers of the internet you know, became a kind of uh, uh, low listeners of uh, yeah, these dangers. Of yeah, of course. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's an irony of history, of course. Yeah. Huh? yeah. yeah. So. Definitely. Yeah. Although, you know, I'm not so, I'm quite wary of, you know, what I call myself European offline romanticism. This is not really what, uh, uh, there's quite a few of my friends who go in that direction. And obviously, this is what you will find, uh, you know, throughout the German speaking countries. Uh, this is very strong. Um, uh, with uh, courses that people uh, give about digital detox and so on and so on, right? Huh? But I don't want to offer you a digital detox course, right? Uh, this is not, uh, this is not uh, my aim and I don't think that's the solution. So in that sense, I don't want also to run away from the responsibility, first of all. It's my generation that created this mess. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I do not really believe, but we can discuss that, you know, like in reference to Audrey Lord, that like, uh, you know, the, is, is the resolution, is, the, is the, the way we 
think of uh, how to overcome or to repair the, the technical? Is that coming from the technical realm itself or not? So is the solution to this, again, a technical one? Which is, of course, what uh, Eugene Morozov has, has coined. You know, techno-solutionism. And, and it's the techno-solutionism so, techno that, uh, let's say, my generation in particular struggles with, right? If we have created this technical uh, sadness or whatever situation, uh, is the answer to that a technical one, yes or no? And, yeah, so that's where we are in my understanding. Okay. Thank you.